The following program and contents, including the views and opinions expressed by the host and any guest speakers, are solely for informational and entertainment purposes. The views and opinions expressed are not endorsed or supported by Realmar McConnell Media Company, the X Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, or advertisers. The host and guest speakers are solely responsible for their own perspectives and their views do not reflect those of Realmar McConnell Media Company, the X-Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, or advertisers. The information provided in this program should not be considered as professional advice or as a substitute for professional consultation. Listeners and viewers are encouraged to form their own opinions and seek independent advice when necessary. Realmar McConnell Media Company, the X-Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, and advertisers hereby disclaim any liability for any claims, damages, or losses incurred as a result of the information presented in this program. Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiaka bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiaka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiaka. Movement. We tend to take it for granted until it's gone. Why do some people maintain balance and mobility into their latter years while others lose it early on? The answer may surprise you. Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you on Exxon TV, exxontvchannel.com, and the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. We're produced by Relmar McConnell Media Company with studios and corporate offices in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. With us this hour to explore movement, longevity, and the lowly foot is Dr. Emily Spiegel. Dr. Spiegel is a functional podiatrist, human movement specialist, the founder of EBFA Global, creator of Barefoot Training Specialist Certification, author of Barefoot Strong, and CEO, founder of Nubuso Technology. With over 20 years in the fitness industry, Dr. Spickle has dedicated her medical career towards studying postural alignment, human movement as it relates to barefoot science, foot to core integration, and sensory integration. Her website, dremilyspickle.com. Dr. Spickle, thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. Of course. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so do tell, uh, what is a functional podiatrist? Yes. Yeah, so a functional podiatrist is a foot specialist that factors in and looks at the entire body. So there it's, it's not a formal training within podiatry, but in the U.S. podiatry is generally very surgically focused, uh, almost very isolated and not integrated with the rest of the body. Whereas as a functional podiatrist, I factor in sleep, stress, diet, inflammation in the body, and then, of course, functional movement. And I look at all aspects of that for optimizing foot health and therefore movement longevity. So what drew you to the field of podiatry in the first place? It was actually athletics, so movement. Uh, I was a gymnast when I was younger, so a gymnast for 13 years. And then when I got into the fitness industry, it just further supported my passion for movement. When I was looking at graduate schools, medical schools, I knew I wanted to do something related to sports and athletics. Uh, when I first started my podiatry career, my training, 
That's when I saw it was quite isolated. So I actually went back to school, got my master's in human movement, and that allowed me to really take my medical degree and connect it to movement in a very innovative way. Now, by medical degree, you're not an MD, you didn't go to medical school, but a podiatrist degree, right? Well, yes. And so in the U.S., a podiatrist is a doctor of podiatric medicine. So right. mm -hmm. theoretically, it is a doctor, not an MD, but it is a doctor of podiatric medicine. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, most of us think of the feet as simply something to walk on. What are the less known functions of the feet? So, yes. So our feet are our body's foundation. You could think of this as a postural foundation, mechanically, almost like the foundation of a home. If it's not stable, the rest of your skeletal structure will not be stable. So that is one way you could think of the foot. I also like to think of the foot from a sensory perspective. There are thousands of nerves in the bottom of the feet, and those nerves play a very important role in how we maintain balance, how we relate to the ground with every step that we take. Uh, our feet are actually designed to read the ground, so they will auto-adjust with every step that we take. And then in addition, with every step that we take, we are experiencing impact forces. So ground reaction forces, which are perceived as vibration, are sensed through the nerves in the bottom of the feet. And then that communicates how we stabilize our pelvis, how we absorb the energy from the ground and release it when we take another step. So energetics of movement is, is critically housed within the foot. Um, so that becomes very mechanical, sensory, energetics, kinetics, kinematics. Our feet are so powerful to human movement. So are you familiar with the meridians and the pressure points in the feet? So I'm not trained in them, but I am very familiar with them. Uh, I do support acupressure, acupuncture. Again, I'm not trained in it, but I've traveled a lot to Asia for work. So I very much respect an Eastern approach to the foot and ankle. So how does that differ from your approach? I mean. Yes, yeah, so yeah, West, Western medicine takes a very literal approach to the foot and the ankle, to the human body, that they almost need to see something to therefore validate that it is actually occurring in the foot. Uh, I actually take a, a blend in that. There are a lot of things that I understand understand are going on in the foot, but I, I couldn't do an MRI scan or an ultrasound and show and prove the patient that it's happening, but I understand that it is. So that could be low grade inflammation. It could be every time they get stressed out, the nerves, the peripheral nerves in their feet get excited and therefore symptoms increase. Um, our autonomic nervous system, which is a fight or flight response, very much affects the way that our foot uh, circulation can dilate and constrict. So things like that are hard to show in a traditional Western medicine way. So I appreciate it from a Eastern medicine way. Um, I'm very much into management of stress through meditation and releasing trauma and somatic experiencing and how all of those things affect the way that pathology pain may present itself in the foot and the ankle. So stress can actually affect our feet? Stress can absolutely, I mean, stress affects everything. <laughs> stress is, uh, so I will explain this to my patients that stress is like a acid, like it's acidic, it's inflammation as well. And we know that inflammation is so damaging to every connective tissue, every nerve, every aspect of the human body. We age from inflammation, but we also age from acidity, so I, I try to kind of explain that it's it's either an acid or inflammation, and that's what stress creates. So could someone get elevated neuritis, nerve pain or nerve sensation in their feet when they are stressed? Absolutely. So you, you mentioned that in the Western approach, we like to have things that we can see or measure. Um, but then you also mentioned that the, the way the nerves are operating the feet are, are hugely complex and very involved and very necessary. Is there a way to measure how well the nerves in the feet are operating? So you can, you can do what's called an NCV slash EMG, and these are nerve conduction tests and then electromagnetic tests. So you're essentially testing the muscle 
reaction to stimuli. The thing is, though, that as you get further and further away from the spinal cord, the brain, the nerves become very small. So they don't get picked up the same on an NCV EMG as, say, a bicep or a quad. So these are larger muscles. Um, so therefore, a lot of that has to be kind of intuitive. Can you do a punch biopsy? and look under a microscope and count nerves that are in the skin? Absolutely. But again, a lot of tests like that, the way that a patient presents and what they're telling you, I know, I know already what the punch biopsy is going to say. I know what the NCV is going to say. So a lot of that is through intuition through experience. And then those tests are not fun <laughs> for patients. Some of them are not painful. You're breaking the skin. If they, maybe they're a diabetic with neuropathy, now, now you're breaking the skin and they could get infected. So we don't want to necessarily have to do a diagnosis or a diagnostic test to get to a diagnosis, which is kind of interesting because that's how medicine used to be practiced is that they didn't have all these high tech expensive diagnostic tests that we have now, especially in the, the U.S. that pushes that, that it was a lot done off of palpation, listening to the patient, and then trying to incorporate other alternative methods. Unfortunately, those days are gone, right? I know. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Uh, I've, I've been in to have medical treatment done, and the doctor stuck his head in the door, and that was it. You know, <laughs> never touched me, just waited for the test. It's like, but it's right here. <laughs> so, yeah, I understand. But the tests are great. I mean, they, they, they're, you know, thank God we have them in some cases. So what are the symptoms? If I'm, I'm, saying, if I'm saying, okay, something may be wrong with my feet. Now, I don't necessarily have foot pain, but are there other symptoms that something's going awry that's affecting the whole body? So there are different things that can present. Um, I'll give one that maybe people are not aware of could be like a fungal infection in the feet. Oftentimes that can represent that there's something that is disrupted in your gut biome. So do you have a disruption in your bacterial flora, which is affecting systemically your natural defenses against things like fungus? That is one that a lot of alternative doctors will speak about in reference that that may be something the listeners are like, oh, I never thought of my gut biome affecting a athlete's foot in my foot or fungal nails. So if a person is having um, structural difficulty, okay, back pain, this or that, how can we tell if it's coming from the feet or not? So doing a foot typing. So this is very important. I do a foot typing on all of my patients. I want to see them stand. I watch them all walk. And I'm looking at what is that mechanical foundation. Let's say just as an example that the feet are collapsing in. So they're rolling in, which is called overpronation. But when that happens, then your lower leg starts to rotate in. The knees knock. Your hips roll. Your pelvis goes forward. So you could say, oh, my lower back pain or my sciatica is actually caused by my foot foundation, which is unstable, but I'm feeling it or it's talking to me in my lower back or in my hip in the sciatic nerve. Sounds like it could be pretty complicated. I, unfortunately, it's or fortunately, it's time for a station <laughs> break. So we'll continue with this on the other side. Dr. Spiegel and I will return very shortly. Don't you go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moon Men, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right. As Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? 
Moon Man is a gripping page turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind bending journey into the unknown where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sabrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrel.com. That's S I B R E L.com. Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core. Is there more to the feet than meets the eye? With us discussing the importance of foot health is the author of Barefoot Strong, Dr. Emily Spiegel. Dr. Spiegel, what, um, the foot seems like a very complex <laughs> part of the body, probably more so than a lot of them. Um, can, what can you tell us about the complexities of the foot? Yeah, so I often joke that it takes four years to go through podiatric medical school plus three years of residency, and we learn nothing but the foot, which just demonstrates how complex it is that it takes that many years. Um, so a few fun facts about the foot is that there are 26 muscles in the bottom of the foot, and those small muscles in the bottom of the foot play a very important role in balance, how we absorb energy. There's over a hundred ligaments on the top of the foot, which is why when we are pregnant, the relaxin hormone, which allows us to give birth, also relaxes all those ligaments on the top of the feet. So your feet can actually grow bigger as you are pregnant because of the ligaments. Uh, as I'd mentioned before, there's thousands of nerves in the bottom of the feet. Those nerves play a really important role in balance. And one of my favorite fun facts about the foot on the bottom is that the peak sensitivity of the nerves in our feet is age 40. By the time you are 70, you need twice as much stimulation to create the same response, which means feet are so important to movement and balance. If we start to lose that sensitivity and we get this damping or dulling of how we feel our feet, we really need to be stimulating our feet as we age. Um, kind of like the old saying that what you don't use, you lose. And the importance of doing crossword puzzles or Sudoku for cognitive protective, we need to think the same for our peripheral nerves with the aging process. So does that, is that part of the reason that people can start to lose stability as they age, even though they stay active and this and that? 100%, 100%. You can only stabilize as well as you can feel your body in space or feel your feet. So where do you stand on foot surgery? I, I've seen a lot of it and I haven't seen a whole bunch of it go well. So what's your stance on it? Yeah, so I was actually trained as a surgeon. It's required in the U.S. to get licensed. So I had to be trained as a surgeon. That was a three-year residency. I did surgery for five years out of residency and was not passionate about it. Um, I have friends and colleagues who are way more passionate about it, and they are the ones who should be the surgeons because they absolutely love it. So back in 2017, I stopped doing surgery. So my website says I put my scalpel down for the last time, which means once you stop, you can't go back. I'm going to lose the skill in my hands surgically. And I shifted my practice to be functional and regenerative podiatry, which is what it is now that much more sits with how I believe in the human body and my role in healthcare. Um, there is a, a time and place for surgery. I still act as a second opinion for surgical consultations to guide a patient and say, do I agree as a functional podiatrist that surgery makes sense? And then oftentimes that patient is like, okay, I just, I really appreciate your perspective in addition to the surgeon's perspective, who obviously is going to push surgery. So if you were to guess, what percentage of the time is our alternative methods as effective or more effective than surgery? I mean, I, I, what I can say on like plantar fasciitis is 90% of plantar fasciitis will resolve, resolve on its own. So, and then let's say a bunion, if you start to prevent or manage a bunion on the early side of it is the way that you want to avoid surgery, 
right? So the rise in preventive medicine in general is really helping a lot of patients avoid foot surgery. But on a percent, the people who actually need surgery is probably 1% of the people that actually present in a podiatry office. So um, you were talking about plantar fasciitis. Are there other mes muscles involved rather than just the ones in the foot? Say, for instance, the one at the heel that's attached to the Achilles tendon. Um, so is there more to, to it, the foot than meets the eye as far as that's concerned? Yeah, so with plantar fasciitis, our plantar fascia, which is a thick banded tissue on the bottom of the foot, it originates on the heel bone, comes across the bottom of the arch, and as it goes towards the toes, it's actually going to split into five pieces and insert onto the base of the toes. So any sort of issue with the ball of the foot or into the toes could actually be related to the plantar fascia. But then your plantar fascia, you are correct, actually goes behind. It's going to wrap around the heel like a saran wrap. That's all actually called your periosteum. And then it blends into your Achilles tendon, becomes your calf. Your calf blends into your hamstrings. Your hamstrings run into your lower back, so your erector spinae, and it continues all the way to the top of your head. So you can definitely have an effect of tight plantar fascia or plantar fasciitis and anything up that posterior chain. That's why also if someone has plantar fasciitis, we say release your calves, release your hamstrings, bring balance to the posterior muscles because they are all connected. It's amazing how we are all connected, isn't it? So yeah. you're telling me you can have serious foot pain and it has nothing to do with the foot until the calf, say, for instance, got overuse or shortened and then start tugging on the connection site of the plantar, plantar, right? Absolutely. So honestly, the hips and the pelvis are oftentimes almost always involved with something in the foot. So when I work with a patient, I will never have them just address the foot. Every single one of my patients is addressing the foot and the pelvis in every situation because they're so interconnected. And theoretically, you could continue that up. And I would say it goes all the way to the T-spine or the rib cage. And if your T-spine or your rib cage is locked, you're going to affect the pelvis, which will affect the foot. Well, I know in rolfing, there's a lot to be said about the sphenoid bone, the balance of the sphenoid bone. And we've had, you know, in this day and age, we have an awful lot of head injuries due to automobile accidents and that sort of thing. Do you find that sometimes a maladjusted sphenoid can then affect the feet? Absolutely. Absolutely. Another one is the jaw. I'm not, I'm not deeply into that, but any subtle shift of the jaw, because these muscles connect to your occipitals back here that that's going to then continue down the chain. So you could very much appreciate something up top affecting something all the way down. So um, how does the way a person's feet hit the ground affect their overall health? So our, this, this goes back to energetics is how I will describe it. So every time we take a step, you are experiencing ground reaction forces these are perceived as vibration. That vibration, so vibration, is energy. It's your body's energy to take the next step. Now, if you strike the ground unstable or really hard for whichever reason, maybe it's a lack of awareness of your movement, you are going to experience excessive or uncontrolled vibration. Now, vibration is really what I believe causes plantar fasciitis. It's what causes Achilles tendonitis, shin splints, stress fractures, issues into the IT band. So you are essentially getting these overuse or impact injuries that really, I hate to blame impact forces because impact forces is so important to how we move that I like to educate on the process of stabilizing or the process of bringing in awareness to your foot ground contact so that you are, I call it dancing with the ground. You are symbiotic with the ground and we have to move with an element of grace. And I know that this is a, a Ida Rolf always spoke about this. And I listened to another one of your guests who spoke exactly how I do is based off of we are dancing with the ground. 
with every step that we take, even with our shoes on, we are dancing with the ground. And how can we elevate our relationship so that we are optimizing those vibrations as they enter our body? There's um, a lot of um, talk today about grounding or earthing um, mm -hmm. and having the feet literally, literally, uh, electromagnetically ground with the earth. What's your take on that? I'm a huge fan of earthing and grounding. So that is something that I will recommend to my patients. It's actually one of my uh, daily beliefs that people should do. I will recommend, you know, 15 minutes a day. Can they go outside, be on the grass, on the dirt, do it naturally? Of course, there are grounding mats and other ways that you can do it based on where you live and weather as well. But there's actually a lot of research around grounding and earthing. And for the listeners, if they want to research any of it, Dr. Sinatra um, did a lot of research around this. And I actually met him at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. They do an anti-aging conference every year. And I met him and was able to listen to some of his research. So he was very, very important in the, the growth and awareness of grounding. Yes, we've had him on the show, and it was a delight. Oh, wonderful. Oh, he's amazing. It was a delight. Just, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the the grounding piece. And are, are there, let's talk a little bit about emotions and the feet. Is there, um, sometimes people don't want to be here. They've had trauma, and mm -hmm. they kind of perch on their feet. They don't really stand on the ground. You can just see the way they walk if, you, if you're a movement specialist, that there's, you know, they're just not really contact. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so that would really go towards the sensory side of the foot. Um, and what the way that I use the sensory side of the foot with emotion is we spoke about grounding from a energetic perspective, even though this is energetic, but more of an emotional perspective is literally grounding, meaning I feel my feet, I feel gravity and my feet on the ground. I am present, I am stable. So that's the way that I try to help people connect and use the foot. Um, yes, there is a dissociative kind of a, a guarding or a shutdown response based off of how people relate to trauma, which is going to affect their movement. Um, they're going to have very much of a lack of awareness of their body and their movement because they're disassociating from trauma, which can then lead to certain injuries. My role then is to say, for me to help you optimize your movement or to heal this chronic injury to your foot, I need you to, you have to be able to feel your body. Let's use sensory stimulation of your hands and your feet to help you feel safe. And let's use the language and teach you that when you feel a, a neural ball or something like that, that you're saying like, okay, I feel this, I'm safe, I'm here. And then you're making essentially anchors or associations for it. Um, I do work with many cranial sacral therapists that when they do things like this, they will use the Naboso mats or have them barefoot, have them holding neural ball or holding something. And they will use that as their anchor to presence when they're going through this. So we're just about out of time in this segment, but um, do you find that sometimes when people are using an anchor that it'll bring up more emotion, more blocked emotion? Um, it can, but if they're working with a trained specialist, like a somatic experiencing specialist or a trauma specialist, then, then they understand that that's how they're being navigated. So they're, they're being guided through the experience. Mm, um, it's, it is that time for our, our station break. Dr. Splickle and I will be right back to continue our discussion. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. 
The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics, including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www. MissionEvolution.org How healthy are your feet? This is Mission Evolution, MissionEvolution.org. Our guest this hour is Dr. Emily Spiegel. Her website, DrEmilySpiegel.com. Dr. Emily, um, what is the sensory side of food, of foot health? Yes, yeah, so the sensory side of foot health is really based off of touch. So we have special nerves. This is in our hands and our feet, and they are called mechanoceptors, but really you could call them touch nerves, tactile nerves. And that is one of the most important ways in which we experience the external world. For the hands, people can appreciate fine motor skills like buttoning a button, doing surgery, things like that. But our feet really need to have that same experience because they are the only contact point between the body and the ground. Now, of these nerves, there's only three main stimuli that people can think about. First one is texture or really two-point discrimination. So Braille, when we read Braille, we are using a very specific tactile nerve in our fingers. And then Naboso is essentially based off of two-point discrimination texture. The second one is skin stretch. So when we hold things, there's an element of friction or stretch that is stimulating the mechanoceptors as well. And then vibration. Vibration, I've been talking about a lot because that's what ground reaction forces are. That is actually 70% of the nerves in the bottom of the feet are sensitive to vibration. And that demonstrates that impact forces or really movement is at the core of what our foot function is based on. And our nervous system is designed for movement or bipedalism, for walking. And that's just represented through 70% of the nerves in the feet are sensitive to vibration. The skin stretch and the tactile are additional feedback that you could bring into the foot. But when I'm thinking about fall reduction, athletes, uh, people who stand on their feet for work, you really want to keep the foot not just quote unquote support, Supported, but you want to keep the foot sensorily stimulated through tactile nerves. Okay, so that brings up the question, what happens when we got so smart we decided we had to have shoes on all the time? Yes, amazing question. So what's <laughs> supposed to happen when you wear a cushion in your shoes is you sensorily disconnect your foot from the stimuli. So you start to create movement patterns without all of the information, which means the accuracy of your movement decreases, increased falls, maybe a little clumsy, maybe some injuries, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, because again, you want the information. You actually need the information. If the shoe takes the information, you are moving with like earmuffs on in a sentence right? So that's, that's why I'm an advocate of barefoot stimulation. It doesn't mean barefoot running. That's a different, different thing. It's barefoot stimulation every single day for at least 30 minutes. So you can keep that nervous system stimulated and then choosing footwear that supports a sensory rich environment. So we have so many people, I mean, um, running shoes and, and the like are um, really the norm for people to wear. What does that do to our grounding? And what does that do to the, the sensory um, input? Yeah, since we were talking about grounding, grounding from a positive negative charge, Dr. Sinatra, is anything like a rubber is going to block the ability to ground. 
So if we are then in shoes, shoes that have rubber in them, the cushion and the materials that are used, you take away that natural healing response, which is why I advocate, okay, can we do 15 minutes of being outside on the grass, on the dirt, so that you can get that natural polarity from the earth for that aspect. Um, now, I'm sorry, when you say outside on the grass, on the dirt, are you talking about barefoot on, outside on the grass, on the dirt? Yes. Or with so shoes on? No, barefoot. Yeah. So no shoes, no socks. <laughs> you want to do it totally barefoot and get that negative charge from the planet, right? So you're just, you said, think like a battery. You're just recharging your battery, theoretically, even though it's a little bit different, but it's a good analogy for people to think about for just supporting that natural circadian rhythm that comes from the earth. Chronically in shoes, chronically on concrete, chronically in our high-tech, urban, advanced Western world, you start to just notice different things. Um, so to me, it's one of my favorite ways is to take off the shoes, ground, stimulate the feet, try to get out of that rubberized environment and cushioned environment um, to just become more natural. So say we've uh, lived in this in this environment. We've kept our feet separate from the time we could toddle because our folks put us in these expensive shoes, right? These little baby shoes that don't move. Um, and does that then atrophy, as you were mentioning, our ability to communicate with the earth? Once that atrophy has taken place, is there a way to build it back? I mean, some of us never get the total effect, do we? Uh, so yes, so there is actually research demonstrating that you do get atrophy of the muscles of the nerves. So this is where you could see research saying chronic use of supportive shoes, custom orthotics, arch supports causes atrophy of the intrinsic muscles. So the 26 muscles in the bottom of the feet, also denervation. Um, denervation can be demonstrated on an MRI. I see it in various patients or an atrophine. What happens when you denervate or atrophy intrinsic muscles is, you know, obviously you got to try to challenge it to get the growth back, um, depending on the duration at which the impaired nerve stimuli has been around. It's not entirely reversible. There are some supplements that do increase nerve growth factor. Um, those are in my book. Um, but things like acetylocarnitine, arlopoic acid, um, L-methylfolate, things like that are very nerve protective and can increase nerve growth factor. So those are things that you can do. I'm a huge fan of red light therapy and photobiomodulation and what that does to the nervous system and nerve tissue. So there's ways that you could try to offset it, reverse it, slow it. When someone does have atrophy and denervation, what I say is if I can get you 50% back to where you were, I consider that a success. Is there cases uh, or are there a lot of cases where a person never really got to develop it in the first place because of the footwear we put on our children? I mean, I think that would be an interesting study, an interesting longitudinal study to look at. Um, and that probably anthropological studies would see changes in maybe the size or the shape of feet, homo sapien feet through the years as we become more shod. Um, some of the pathology that you see like bunions in children is actually caused by the foot type, not by the shoes. So I do think that it would be an interesting longitudinal study to see, okay, what is the effect on the progression or regression of human movement based off of being in a shod society? If you were to advise parents um, of children that are small, getting ready to get up on their feet and walk, what would you suggest they put on their feet? Oh my gosh, if they are not ambulatory, nothing. <laughs> no socks, no shoes. I get if they're cold, maybe little baby socks, but try to take them off as much as you can. Um, and this, again, so important if they are not walking, so they are probably 12 months or less, then definitely not having socks or shoes on them. And then even outside. So a lot of parents will put shoes on but they might be ambulatory, but they're not walking outside yet. So my daughter walked at nine months and she, she she's barefoot as long as she could. And then at 18 months, I had to finally kind of cave in and put 
shoes on her because it was so cold outside. But before that, for 18 months, she was barefoot the entire time. And that played such an important effect in her movement awareness, her movement accuracy, the progression of her movement. So I try to recommend that to parents. And then when you do choose shoes, you want shoes that you can fold and twist and like rustle up. The structure of a baby shoe is so unnecessary and they grow out of them so quick anyway. Do not spend a lot of money on these shoes. <laughs> yeah, I started, I started my children out in moccasins. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so why do so many people in the U.S. and Canada have serious foot problems? Why do they? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I would say that it's it's shoes. A lot of it is based off of shoes. I do think it's also the lack of mass population awareness to the importance of feet. So we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> so trying to bring this and make it a priority to educate younger populations that, oh, your feet are important. Um, that's one of my personal missions is to make foot health the same as how people think about oral health. And here in the US, the American Dental Association has done a really good job of making oral health a very important thing. There's education of when you should start to go to a dentist as a child. My daughter went to the dentist at 12 months old. <laughs> so there's something that is educated into the population, essentially. We need to do that same thing with foot health and say, what is foot recovery? Oh, everyone should be massaging their feet every day. Okay, we need to make smart footwear choices. Okay, there's a role of getting barefoot sensory stimulation in our feet at all ages. And then we can start to see a decrease in foot health problems. What about flexibility of the foot? Um, there's a wide range. I've seen people that just their feet have, they don't have any spring to them. They are kind of amphibian. They just sit on the ground. They aren't connected with them um, versus people that pick stuff up with their toes. Um, so how does flexibility play in here? So what flexibility, you kind of want to dance between an ideal mobility stability, someone who has a ligament lax foot where it completely drops down. Again, that over pronated collapsing, the midfoot is sitting on the floor is typically built around ligament laxity. Now, just because you have ligament laxity doesn't mean that you have met the mobility requirements. So it's, it's about understanding your foot. It's about mobilizing the muscles if you need to, you know, the bottom of the foot, the calves, releasing those, understanding that if your hip is tight, your foot is going to get tight. So those are that's a muscle mobilization. But then we have to get into a tissue stabilization. So that is finding and having an awareness of your foot of what is called neutral, or I call it setting your base. So how do you set your base? What is the foot tripod? Where are our toes supposed to sit? Long, straight, and wide. Rotate a little bit in the hips to lift that arch. So it's a, it's a, it's a dance between both. And just because you have the dexterity to pick up things with your feet, maybe might not mean that you have sufficient ankle mobility or ankle proprioceptive awareness. It seems so complex. <laughs> we're, we're just about out of time in this segment, but when we get back, I'd like to talk about different uh, activities that how they affect the body and what we can look for. Please stay with us as Dr. Spiegel and I continue to explore functional podiatry. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. <laughs> Are you ready to dive into the mysteries of the unknown? Tune into the electrifying X-Zone radio TV show hosted by the one and only Rob McConnell. I'm Rob McConnell and get ready for a mind-bending journey through the unexplained phenomenon that surrounds us all. From UFO encounters to cryptids, ghosts and everything in between, we've got it covered here in the X-Zone. 
Rob McConnell, the seasoned investigator and renowned radio personality, brings you the most compelling interviews with top experts, authors, and experiences from around the world. Each episode is an unforgettable exploration into the depths of the extraordinary. That's right, Exo Nation. Join me every week as we open the door to the supernatural and explore the strange and amazing stories that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And it's not just radio anymore. With our groundbreaking TV show, you can now witness the sessions unfold right before your eyes. From chilling reenactments to captivating visuals, prepare yourself for a multimedia experience like never before. With a legacy spanning over two decades, the X Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, is your ultimate source for mind blowing entertainment and thought provoking discussions. Join our growing community of truth seekers as we continue to unlock the world's mysteries. So, why wait? Step into the X Zone and embark on a journey that will challenge your beliefs, ignite your curiosity, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Remember, Exxon Nation, the truth is out there, and it's waiting for you right here on the Exxon Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't miss a minute of the action. Tune in now on your favorite radio station or visit TV.com to join the adventure. The Exxon Radio TV show with Rob McConnell, where reality meets the unknown. The Exazone Radio TV show, unraveling the secrets of the universe, one episode at a time. For more information visit www.exazoneradiotv.com. Do you have a product or service you'd like to promote to a worldwide audience? Imagine your product featured on Mission Evolution Radio TV. If you're interested in showcasing your work, Mission Evolution is broadcast to the Exxon TV Channel 32, Simul TV, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and many other audio and social media platforms. Our professional studios can produce and broadcast your custom high-quality ad. It will be permanently embedded in each episode and featured in the archives for years to come. Together, we can make it happen. Contact us at info at missionevolution.org for more details. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this great opportunity. Email info at missionevolution.org today. What happens when your feet let you down? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Dr. Emily Spiegel. Her website, DrEmilySpeichel.com. Dr. Emily, there's a lot of things that we do, um, and particularly with our children. You know, there's all these sports and all these, you know, art forms that involve the body and the feet. Like, say, for instance, um, I trained in dance from a very young age. So my feet, I, ballet, so the feet go out, right? <laughs> and then I start having low back problems. So then I went, I became I uh, studied Taekwondo for eight years, and then the feet have to go inward, and it seemed to kind of correct itself. It wasn't my plan, mm -hmm. but it brought my mind to how many things that we think are good for our children, activities, or good for ourselves, that really can compromise our feet and therefore the rest of our body. I mean, sports and sport footwear is definitely going to be an effect, uh, probably Soccer cleats, football cleats are some that come to mind very much because they're restrictive, they're stiff, they're intentionally tight. So in soccer, um, they will be tighter than we think. Um, certain sports like martial arts, as you had mentioned, they're barefoot, so but they're in different positions, gymnastics. So what I try to educate parents would be understand the stress that the sport puts on the foot and then what can we do as a reset every day and then educate our children to reset their feet so then they take that that foot health habit into their adulthood and that is something important and I work with a lot of children athletes very talented children athletes and I'll explain to the child that the the 
longevity of their career, because let's say if you're a gymnast, your career is over at like 20, <laughs> your athletic career, but you, you want to do what you can now, even if you don't have any pain and you don't think that it will affect you, trust me, it will affect you. And you need to do this to really support that career. So your dream of being in the Olympics or play, playing for, you know, a professional team, we need to do this now. And then the parents essentially reinforce what I'm then telling them. So do socks um, interfere as much as, well, obviously not as much as uh, tennis shoes, but do, do socks interfere? Um, say you're in a cold climb and you've got a hard surface floor in your house. Does going uh, sock in, in your socks versus barefoot, is there a difference there? So yes, there is. So certain socks, so a traditional sock shape, especially if it's a little bit tighter, can cause a similar effect on the toes. It could crunch the toes in. It could create kind of that angulation of a bunion. So yes, uh, I am a big fan of toe socks. So if someone wants to wear like five pocket socks to keep the toes individual, really good to maintain that. Uh, one thing that I used to observe in my patients would be compression socks. So if there is compression into the digits, into the toes, it can actually really force the toes down like this, and then that could have an effect. And then of course there's the sensory barrier, kind of like mittens on your hands, you lose the dexterity and the sensory stimulation that can have an effect as well. What can a person expect to see if they start um, doing the things that you suggest, going barefoot, going barefoot outside, um, checking their movement and their stances? What, what differences can they expect to see that they might not expect or associate with the feet? So typically people will say less fatigue, overall, meaning postural fatigue, movement fatigue. If there was any diffuse pain in the foot, then people will typically say that kind of that all over heaviness of their feet decreases. Uh, I mean, some people say they sleep better. Some people have, say that they have more energy, probably more better moods. Um, I do have some patients when I practice in New York City down in Wall Street area that I would teach them about sensory stimulation. And I've had many say that their focus at work it dramatically increased through that. And I just think that that's the connection of sensory stimulation and focus and learning and just kind of cognitively what it has an effect. So that's kind of some of the idea of what people could expect through foot awareness, foot strengthening, foot mobilization on a consistent basis. So what I'm hearing you say here is there's quite a connection between uh, neurology and the feet. 100%. What is that connection? How, how do we see that? So from a neurology perspective, we want to think about central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system is your somatic, somatosensory system, which is movement. And then it's also your autonomic nervous system. So all three of those are essentially dancing or represented through your feet. The somatosensory, meaning movement, is you touch something, you feel it, the signal goes to your central nervous system, your brain, to create a motor response. That would be the nerves in the bottom of the feet that we spoke about. But then your autonomic nervous system, which is part of that, would be the stress that we spoke about. Um, if anyone ha is familiar with or heard of complex regional pain syndrome or RSD, so these are like a reflex sympathetic disorder. So they're, they're autonomic disruptions where someone could sprain their ankle and then they have chronic, ridiculous chronic pain in their foot because of a, a nerve disruption. That's the autonomic nervous system that's being disrupted. That is a sympathetic trigger. So that would be kind of stress. Stress is your autonomic nervous system. You go into fight or flight. That affects the circulation to the feet, the way that the hair on your leg grows is autonomic. So it's very interesting that the way that we move, the way that we feel our feet, our stress, circulation to the skin, and then our brain and how our brain processes it are all deeply incorporated. So it's about that time in the show when I get to ask you, Dr. Emily, what's your mission? My mission is to empower people to take foot health into their own hands. Well, their total body health, but really their foot health 
into their own hands to understand their body so that they can make sound decisions and not have to wait for someone with a white jacket to tell them what to do and that they should be prioritizing their health and their foot health so that that can support my overall mission, which is movement longevity. I like movement and longevity, particularly at my age, right? <laughs> so th this might seem a little off, but what does um, our foot contact and our grounding and all the fun stuff we've been talking about um, for the last hour, what does that have to do with situational awareness? So situational awareness, meaning presence. So to me, that, that word means present. I feel my body. I'm here in the room. That is very much based off of touch and sensory stimulation. So situational awareness and the presence of your body, you have to be able to have a positive relationship with sensory stimulation. Touch is my favorite. Um, others could be compression. So I like to use tactile, which is naboso, compression apparel, wrist weights, weighted vests, um, kinesiology tape, things that allow you to feel, really feel your body in space and be present with it so that that can extend into emotional situational awareness, um, altercations, how you interact with other people. So that it becomes very complex, but I believe that it starts with feeling your body in space. And it seems like we've been um, taught not to, okay? For right down to the clothes that we wear, whoever designed pantyhose, right? <laughs> so so is do not do are we behind the power curve here? Do we need to um, really take some action to um, correct our lack of situational awareness? And what would be the first step? Yes, so I would say the first step is to take your shoes off, you can take them off now if you want, if they're on. <laughs> but take your shoes off and get at least 30 minutes of barefoot stimulation a day. That 30 minutes could be around your home. The 30 minutes could be taking yoga or Pilates. It could be combined with grounding outside if you would like. Um, and then look for other ways that you can connect to your foundation. I have a lot of exercises on my YouTube I teach people how to do short foot, the forward lean, how to activate and contract the small muscles in the foot, and then to make smart footwear choices based off of your understanding, your appreciation of sensory stimulation. Is there some things to watch for if, if we have do have a challenging background that might be brought to the surface if we're just doing our own uh, sensory uh, awareness and stimulation? So let's say, yeah, so let's say you don't understand your foot type or you have a history of plantar fasciitis or you have a history of foot surgery or a stroke, any of those, um, is you can still start with a nice dose of barefoot stimulation. I mean, I'm talking brush your teeth barefoot, right? Like <laughs> walk and have your breakfast barefoot, cook dinner barefoot. So it's, you're just trying to bring it into something that is still a safe movement pattern that is not excessive. I'm not telling you to run or jump barefoot where you're concerned of impact and injuring yourself. So there's a way to do that. Now, if you are wearing supportive shoes because of maybe you have fat pad atrophy in your feet, which is a reality and you have to be in a thicker cushioned shoe, could you bring a sensory insole into that environment, which is part of what what I do through Naboso is I have textured insoles so people can feel their feet. So there is a way, and I, I'm a realist at heart, is I have my beliefs, and then you have the patient or the individual, and both of our beliefs have to kind of meet so that they work together. So I, I'm not polar in my recommendations. I have sound beliefs, but I understand that I'm coming at a patient and I have to work with what their reality is and what works for them. Cushion shoes might be what they want. And how do I work with that? So um, another thing that's, that comes to mind is um, we have a lot of different uh, hard, hard and soft surfaces in our homes. So we have carpet with padding or we have tile or we have artificial uh, wood floors or real wood floors. How do those impact what, uh, the stimulation of the feet? 
So typically we would want to be on a harder surface. So a hardwood floor versus a wrestling mat. So when I'm thinking about exercise, right? We'd go into the group exercise studio versus the stretching mat part of the gym. Or if you do at home workouts, could you be in your dining room versus in the living room, which is carpeted? So we're just kind of playing with surfaces. But again, typically harder surfaces are more stimulating. Now there's a caveat to that. And this was demonstrated through COVID when people were home much longer. And now that I live in Arizona is that a lot of people have marble floors because of the temperature it has to stay cooler. Certain floors can be very hard on the foot when you're standing on them for really long hours. So I saw an uptick in plantar fasciitis and heel spurs and those issues as well. I can see that. We unfortunately are out of time. Dr. Spiegel, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Our guest this hour has been Dr. Emily Spiegel, author of Barefoot Strong. To find out more about Dr. Spiegel, where you can get her book and all she has to offer, visit her website, dremilyspiegel.com. This has been Mission Evolution with Golda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. But please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission continues bringing information, resources, and support to our evolving world. Music